Hello, human geographers. We begin today's lecture by discussing perhaps the most important tool of the geographer, maps. A map is a two-dimensional, or flat, representation of Earth's surface, or a portion of it. And the process that creates maps is known as cartography, which is the art and science of making maps, including data compilation, layout, and design. It's also concerned with the interpretation of mapped patterns. So therefore, someone who makes maps is a cartographer. But no map is perfect, and no map can show us everything. So cartographers have important choices to make when they create maps. Those choices will be the focus of this lecture. There are two major categories of maps, reference maps and thematic maps. Reference maps focus on places, while thematic maps focus on data. Reference maps show locations of places and geographic features, but without analysis or interpretation. These can include physical maps, political maps, road maps, or even subway maps. This reference map shows us where things are, including physical features like mountains, as well as the names of states and major highways. Thematic maps, on the other hand, tell stories. And that is the most important note for this slide. Thematic maps tell stories. For a moment, what story do you think this map of the Human Development Index is telling us? Jot down some of your guesses in your notes. Thematic maps tell their story by showing the degree of some attribute or the movement of a geographic phenomenon. These maps emphasize spatial patterns or the distribution of a single attribute or the relationships between multiple attributes. Cartographers that create thematic maps must collect and organize huge amounts of information, what we call data aggregation. And because there are different ways to display that data, there are multiple types of thematic maps. In the same way that different authors can tell their stories through books, television, radio, or other mediums, there are several different ways for cartographers to tell their stories through thematic maps. And there are five major types of thematic maps. Those are choropleth maps, dot distribution maps, graduated symbol or proportional symbol maps, isoline maps, and cartograms. And each of these maps will organize or aggregate data and display them in different ways thereby affecting the stories they tell and how that can influence our understanding of the information behind that story. Now, let's take a look at each one in greater depth. Corpleth maps will typically have different shades of one color to represent variations in different amounts of a single data set. For example, each of these maps examine COVID cases, but they are aggregated or organized by different units of space. One is organized by country, another by U.S. state, and finally within states by U.S. counties. What do you notice about these maps? What observations do you have? What story do they tell? Does one map tell a story more or less effectively? What questions do you have? These maps 
tend to be very common, and thus people usually have experience reading them. However, they can be very general, and that can cause issues with the way that the data is grouped together or visualized. Typically, cartographers stick to four or five shades of a color. Less than that, we start to group together data that we probably should differentiate between. And more colors than that, like this map with seven classes, can make it difficult to differentiate between different classes of data. Dot distribution or dot density maps, as the name implies, will show the distribution, or more specifically, the density of one attribute. This can be very helpful in doing geographical analysis, but it can also be very difficult to collect this data. All of the dots have to be fixed to a specific point. We call that point data. They can't just be thrown randomly on the map. So tools like GPS are often used to help collect and map this data. It's not uncommon for dot distribution maps to have no key. Notice the map on the right, which displays the location of Walmarts throughout the United States. There's no key. It just shows the location of each Walmart over time. The second map does have a key, but it's to tell us that each dot represents a city with a density of more than 1 million people which is far more useful than putting millions of dots on a single map. The final map also has a key, but that's because we've combined this dot density map with a specific type of choropleth map called a categorical map. So we can see both density with dots, but of different racial or ethnic groups that are separated into different categories. Choose one of these maps. What story is it telling? Or how do you interpret the story? What questions do you have? Take a moment, write that down. Finally, notice on all three maps, the dots do not change size. That's important because on graduated or proportional symbol maps, particularly graduated circle maps, the dots do change size. And notice, on each of these maps, there is a key, so we can tell what the different sized symbols mean. Proportional symbol maps are nice because they combine a graph and a map together. The size of the symbol is proportional to the value it represents, which makes it pretty easy to read. We can see location, but also change as represented in the proportional size of the symbol. Those symbols are often circles, as you can see on the graduated circle maps of the most populous cities and oil consumption by U.S. state. But on flow vector maps, we see arrows of different sizes. So we can determine movement and proportional change. Once again, Choose one of these maps and write down some thoughts about that story. What do you see? Isoline maps are less common, but that doesn't mean you can't tell an important story. They're called isoline maps because the lines connect points of equal value. That's what the prefix iso means, equal. Like connecting points of equal temperatures, in the upper right. Isoline maps can be a little difficult to read if you haven't had much experience with them. So notice that lines that are close together have steep or rapid change, whereas lines that are further apart have more gradual change. Take the map on the left. That's an elevation map, perhaps the most common type of isoline map. Lines that are close together represent rapid elevation change, meaning that those areas are very steep. 
then you have areas where the lines are further apart, which are more gradual inclines, perhaps not as strenuous. Now tell me a story about this isoline map. What is the data? What is it telling us? What questions or observations do you have? Write down some in your notes so we can discuss back in class. Our last type of thematic map are cartograms. In much the same way that proportional symbol maps combine a map and a graph, so do cartograms. But now, the map is the graph. Cartograms distort the shape and size relative to the data it represents. So on the bottom, we have a cartogram of global population. Notice China takes up 10 times more space than Russia because China has 10 times more people than Russia, despite the fact that Russia is significantly larger in land area. So map scale is irrelevant on cartograms. While these are fun and interesting maps, they're subject to a lot of ambiguity and simplification. The wretched dollar shows populations who are living on less than $1 a day, a marker for extreme global poverty. China and India lead the pack. Why do you think that might be? Do you think since they have over a quarter of the world's people, they probably have a lot of the world's poorest people? For China and India, does this map tell the story of their population or their poverty? And on our US election map, is California huge and blue because everyone in California voted for the Democrat? Is Texas huge and red because everyone voted for the Republican? Nope. And it's on the reader to be able to decipher that the size is the population and the color is the candidate that just received the most votes in that state. These are some examples of how we must be critical of these maps and look beyond the map to the real story behind it. So now let's discuss another choice that cartographers must decide on when making their maps. How will they display their reference locations or their thematic data? The reality is it may not matter because it won't be perfectly accurate. Every map of the world is wrong because the earth is round and a map is two-dimensional or flat. So a map projection is the system used to transfer locations from the earth's surface to a flat map. There are several map projections that you will want to know by name because they're very common on the AP exam, like the Mercator, Gall Peters, Goods Homolison, Robinson, and Azimuthal. But there are an almost infinite number of map projections because there isn't one way to project the roughly spherical Earth onto a two-dimensional or flat map. Based on that fact, each of these projections have inaccuracies. We call these inaccuracies distortions. All map projections create distortion, but the types and degrees of distortion vary considerably. And depending on the map's intended use, it is the choice of the cartographer which characteristics to distort and which to hold true. There are four types of distortions, and each of these types have synonyms that you'll want to be familiar with. They are distortions of shape or angle, distortions of area or size, distortions of distance or proximity, and finally, distortions of direction, which sometimes is referred to as compass bearing. We're going to be examining these in greater detail in class. So now that we've examined some of the choices that cartographers can make, let's finish tonight by examining why they might make certain choices. Maps can convey spatial concepts 
In other words, concepts relating to space. So maps can help us understand how space is used. For example, should land be used to build homes or farms, schools or businesses? Maps can also help us understand spatial patterns by examining the placement or arrangement of objects. Here are some of the spatial patterns that can be examined using maps and depending on the choices regarding map type and projection, the map may more or less effectively communicate these spatial patterns. So let's examine what each of these patterns are and how maps and projections can impact their presentation. Absolute distance can be measured using standard units of measure, such as foot, meter, kilometer, or mile, which is why you typically see representation of scale included on maps. Relative distance can express distances in concepts like time or money. Think about how long it takes you to get to the grocery store from your house. The absolute distance doesn't change, but the relative distance might change if you have to walk there versus if you take your bike or ride in a car. And map projections can distort distance. Combine that with projections that may be centered on the Atlantic Ocean that can make the United States and Russia seem very far apart, but a Pacific-centered map shows that their absolute distance is quite close. Direction is another spatial pattern that can be distorted by map projections. Most maps will include some indication of absolute direction using a compass rose or latitude and longitude. And relative direction can be expressed using terms like left, right, up, and down, based on a person's perspective. And, but absolute and relative direction can clash with projections like this. Concentration refers to how close or far apart some spatial pattern is. Dot distribution maps are especially helpful for examining concentration. Notice the areas where people are more clustered or close together and areas where they're more dispersed or spaced out. Isoline maps, as we mentioned earlier, are especially good at communicating patterns of elevation, like we see here with the Western United States. The final and perhaps most important idea that I want to leave you with tonight is that maps are a secondary source, subject to the choices and biases of the cartographer who made it. You must be a critical consumer of information. You should question the information that is presented. How is the data organized or aggregated? Are you looking at raw numbers or percentages? Does the data represent all parts of the map or are there outliers? Who created the map and what might another cartographer do differently? How does the projection or map type influence your interpretation of the story? What did the cartographer include and what did they leave out? And you may never be able to answer all those questions. But if you are thinking critically and questioning what you see, it will benefit you immensely. And that's all for tonight, everyone. I'll see you all back in class.